Hello, welcome to Fans of Fandom. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wesselman, psychologist, professor, and full-time nerd. On this show, I have deep dive conversations with cool people about things that we're fans of. If you're joining us, chances are you're a fan too. Welcome aboard. This series is called Inside the Cosplay. I'm a fan of cosplay, specifically cosplayers. For some, it's a hobby. Then there are those for whom it's a profession. And for others, it's a way of life. Now, regardless of their motivation, I love watching cosplayers do their thing, their passion, their dedication, their creativity. They're wearing their fandom. So in this series, I'm going to feature some of the cool cosplay folks I've worked with in the con world. Let's get started. Today, I am joined by my friend Kelly Mayo. Uh, we met dur uh, while doing panels for uh, the Quad Con series. Uh, and um, which is centered in the Quad City area, but it has since grown uh, to multiple locations across the Midwest. Um, and so we'll we'll talk a little bit about Kelly's experiences uh, with cosplay. Uh, why don't we just start out, Kelly? What uh, is your cosplay origin story? How did you get started on this path? I, I love this question. In the comic book world, everybody has an origin story, right? So. <laughs> Um, I was dealing with chronic depression and anxiety in the early 90s. Uh, I had a coworker who was pushing me to get out of the house and get out amongst people. And they handed me a mask that had a veil in front of it. And I could see out, but nobody could see me. So I was completely anonymous. And I enjoyed the heck out of that convention as just nobody. And I really enjoyed being somebody else for a day. And it helped me get out among people again and conquer some of my fears. So, this is um, this experience of of having the veil so that no one could see you at all. Tell me a little bit more about about the dynamics of that. How it, it kind of helped you feel more free, if you will. It was, it was empowering because I didn't have to worry about if I did something stupid or, uh, you know, tripped all over myself in some way. Uh, nobody knew who I was. I was completely anonymous. And I felt like I wasn't being judged. And I wasn't afraid. It gave me the courage to be among people again. And, and like I said, just be somebody else for a day. Excellent. And um, was it actually part of an established costume or uh, did we just here? Here's a veil. Just a veil. Yep. It was a, it was like a little hood and then it just whoop, had a little veil in front of the face and I just put it on and I just had my regular clothes on and I just walked around and nobody paid any attention to me. And I, I just felt like I could blend in instead of feeling like I was standing out as as like the world's biggest dork somehow. <laughs> When you had um, the veil on, did you create a persona at all? Did, did it, it uh, make you think of yourself at all differently? Well, it, it made me start planning what I wanted to be next time, which turned out to be Poison Ivy. That, that oh. was what I did for the next convention. Then I, I uh, you know, did the face paint, you know, the skin painted and the wig and the ivy down my leg and a green bathing suit. And it just, it was fun to be somebody else. And and again, origin stories. There's a big story behind Poison Ivy and how she's not quite so evil. And, mm -hmm. and so that that appeals to me too, the stories behind the characters that I connect with. Excellent. So um, although you uh, you had mentioned you you painted your face as, as Poison Ivy, right? You it's interesting that this next one you chose no longer had the veil or the mask, right? Uh, did, did you have any sort of hesitation jumping right into that or did you were just like nope I've, I've uh, ripped the band-aid off I'm all in <laughs> yeah, I was, I was kind of all in actually I mean the nerves were there the nerves are still there every time I put on a costume the nerves are still there um mm -hmm. you know wondering if it's gonna fall apart or if I'm gonna pull off the character or, yeah it's I, I jumped right in and even though my face was not covered except a little bit of green um, and I, you know, I had a little halo type thing made of IV on, but the face was wide open, but I, I, I was poison IV that day. So. Cool. Cool. Do you think that, um, you know, you mentioned, for example, that you, uh, still have, um, some nerves, if you will, uh, some performance anxiety, even though you're, you know, you've been doing this for a while now. Well, I know that there's a uh, just sort of general psychological research on, um, 
we can call it performance anxiety, but uh, um, you know, in more technical terms, we could talk it just high physiological arousal. That you know, uh, a lot of athletes, for example, will talk about part of their warm up process. You know, psyching themselves up is a moderate amount of of sort of being on edge, right? Too much, and it gets in the way of performance, but not enough, and it doesn't. Many of these folks say it doesn't give them the edge that they would want to perform their best. Right. You're not putting your best foot forward if you don't have some desire to, to do your best. So mm-hmm. perfect sense. Um, uh, what, what is your, your favorite cosplay? Um, it's hard to narrow it down. I, I honestly, I have over 30 years and over 30 costumes. So it's wow. really hard to narrow it down. And since I connect with each one of the characters in one way or another, it, does, it, it is hard to narrow it down. Um, but I have a couple that I'm going to stick with for Daredevil because mm-hmm. Electra and um, Typhoid are, are two of my, my favorites because, again, the backstories and the complicated mm-hmm. characters, strong women, mm-hmm. um, self-sufficient. Uh, they're not the damsels in distress. That appeals mm-hmm. to me. Um, so, yeah, I would say probably right now I'd narrow it down to my top two would be Typhoid, and Mary, and um, Electra. So. Excellent. So you, you've revisited them multiple times? I have. And each time with, with costumes, not everybody does, but I think a lot of people with the costumes, they update something each time or or something that didn't work or where you need a piece of Velcro or whatever you learn as you as you go along to update. So yeah. mm-hmm. uh, I'll, I will let you uh, put a third one in there, right? You said 30 years. So you give me two, we'll, we'll do another one. And you can revisit a different decade if you want. <laughs> oh boy. Um, let's see. There's one that I haven't actually worn yet and I'm not quite done with yet that I think is going to be one of my favorites. And it's actually Sarah Connor. Um, nice. I'm working on a head that I'm going to be carrying around that is a Terminator head. Like I just, you know, ripped the head off of one of those suckers. And again, strong, empowered, um, doesn't, doesn't need anybody a survivalist I guess um mm-hmm. so sometimes if I don't feel very strong I think mm-hmm. I lean towards the very strong characters so I think that one's going to be in my top three excellent excellent so uh, it's sound um what I'm hearing and correct me if I'm wrong is when you're doing a character selection process there are there are things that you connect with um that maybe you feel are already part of you, but there's also maybe perhaps some sort of a, uh, almost aspirational perhaps, or? Yeah, yeah, in a way. I, I Sometimes I think if we wish we were stronger, mm-hmm. we, we dress up as the characters that are stronger so that we get an idea of what it feels like just, just for a little while. Sometimes mm-hmm. it inspires us to do that more in life. Um, other times it just helps us feel feel that for a day. Mm-hmm. I, uh, my, work has been moving into, I've been doing a lot of work on fandom uh, and uh, particularly its interface with um, superhero stories. Uh, And so that dovetails with the, there's a general area of social sciences called heroism studies. And a lot of the researchers there sort of look at, well, not just who do we define as heroes, but what functions do those heroes um, serve for us socially? right, as well as personally, uh, and there's a lot of this inspirational, you know, this is who I would like to be, and then it does um, seem to uh, motivate us to sort of align ourselves a little bit more with those uh, values that um, that we aspire to, so it's, it's, we see it in multiple ways here. So which cosplay project do you wish you could erase or at least do over? <laughs> oh boy. There's usually several in that list too, but <laughs> I'm going to go with uh, C2E2 one year. I dressed up as Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Ah. Um, I found out that my, my fairly new partner uh, had a thing for the character. And I was like, oh, I can be a blonde for the day, wear a skimpy little jungle outfit, have a spear, you know? It was horrible. I was freezing all day. I didn't, it was the last day I was tired. He, he tried to take pictures and they were devastatingly horrible. And <laughs> not only that, but I had chosen that instead of Electra. I switched days mm. and he met Charlie Cox that day. Oh, so, you know, and I was like, I could have been Electra when he met with 
Charlie Cox and that would have been so cool. But so yeah, if I could go back and redo that one, I would probably probably not do Sheena because I, I wasn't meant to be in a jungle outfit amongst 10,000 people. <laughs> it just it wasn't a good, good choice. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what do you feel is one of the biggest strengths of the cosplay community? Definitely the support um, from the very beginning. Uh, there's, there's a camaraderie, a, a family feeling uh, in a lot of situations for, for cosplay. Um, and so many people that are supportive of those just getting started and supportive of those who are continuing in their journey uh, to be whatever they want to be, if they just want to dress up or if they want to compete or if they want to try and become cause famous on TikTok or whatever it is. There's a lot of support and a lot of family and a lot of uh, encouragement in the community. Excellent. I, I'd not, not heard that term cause famous before. That's cool. Um, yeah, this, uh, this idea of a family of belonging, a lot of the work I've done on fandom has sort of focused on the ways in which these communities, uh, that we connect with, because when we think about what we are fans of, there's our connection to the, the object, if you will, um, you know, so that could be a, a character, a medium, uh, a book series, or in this case, an activity, right? And in some ways, all of the above, though, because you also have the connection to the other fans. And if we think of cosplay as a fan community, it has its nuances that are very different than other fan communities that kind of intersect with it right i mean it's almost like embodied fan. you're, you're wearing your fandom right, right. yeah right. yeah becoming yeah becoming your fandom in a way mm -hmm. how do you feel that it um because you've gone to a lot of cons you've been in a lot of fan spaces um how do you feel that the fan community um of cosplayers how does that compare and contrast to other types of, of fan communities that you've interacted with or been a part of? Well, as, as different as it seems from like sports and all, it really isn't that different. Hmm. Uh, you, you see your, your cheese heads and you see your, you know, the painted faces and you see the, the signs and uh, they're at every game and it's, they're buying the hot dogs, you know, everything that goes along with that for uh -huh. them. Mm -hmm. It's really not that different. So, so as different as a lot of different fandoms seem, mm -hmm. we're all kind of the same in a way. It's just mm -hmm. a different theme or a different feel or a different, you know, outfit. So mm -hmm. I don't find that we're all that different when we come when it comes down to it. Excellent. I, I appreciate those points. Uh when I lecture on on fandom, I usually spend about two or three weeks on it in my uh, social psychology related courses. And I talk about sort of fandom broadly as a way of both balancing the uniqueness of one's identity with fulfilling this sense of belonging uh, of, a, of a social identity aspect as well. Uh, and, you know, I will show pictures of, you know, people playing Dungeons and Dragons and then I'll show pictures of, you know, people with fantasy football setups and, you know, or I'll show some of the comic um, trading cards that I had growing up and then be like, and it's not so different than the baseball cards. Look, they've got stats, right? <laughs> you know, and some people memorize, you know, the lineage of Tolkien characters and other people memorize team statistics and i i really don't see them as that different they're all yeah we're all a lot more alike than we are different when it comes yep. down to yeah um so where do you feel that the cosplay community has room for growth where would you like to see it go um i would like to see a lot of the the younger cosplayers just getting started understand that they have to start somewhere and work their way up that, that don't get discouraged if you throw on a costume that you just made and you go enter a contest and you don't win, don't quit. You, you gotta start mm -hmm. somewhere. You gotta, you gotta earn your way and work hard and, and work your way up. You're not gonna put something on and go be a guest at your second convention you've ever attended ever. That's not how it works. 
So mm-hmm. a lot of people have been working for years and years um, to get there. So take constructive criticism, keep your passion, keep going. Don't quit if it's something that you that you want to do and understand that there's going to be people out there that that give you criticism or people that are downright mean. And you can't let those people stop you because there's 2% of those people and 98% of the people that are going to back you and support you and, and be there for you. So just work hard, start at the bottom, work your way up just like anything else in life and enjoy the heck out of it. Just 100% enjoy yourself. So you and I have seen over the last, well, you know, 10, 15 years or so, uh, an explosion, not just of con visibility, right? And uh, as just a general fan space, but also social media has exploded and it's function not just in cosplayers' lives, but everyone's life. So to what degree do you feel um, this sort of, how has this influenced, if at all, this sort of early cosplayer pitfall that you just identified? Like, has it always kind of been there or do you feel like it's intensified or? I do feel it's intensified and, and it it's because it makes life feel like in general, it's a competition. Mm-hmm. Like everybody's got to top everybody's meal on Facebook or everybody's costume or it's it's not about competing and someone else's successes don't mean your failures. If I see someone else dressed as Domino, I point at him, hey, Domino, you know, like the old Spidey, the Spidey meme, you know, to yes. Spidey. <laughs> that's awesome. you know, that's awesome. Let's get a group and get a group photo. It's not a competition of who has the most accurate costume or who's the sexiest or it's, it should be about being your best you and not competing with everybody else in competition. Sure. You know, if you're getting up on the stage, that's a totally different thing. And that is a competition. But as far as just joining in on, on the costumes, other people having having successes doesn't mean that that you didn't too. So mm-hmm. that's how I about it anyway. <laughs> so there's there's more of the uh the highlighting of the the communal aspect, right? The sort of celebration of what you all have in common, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but with social media, it's all become a contest. It, it's about who has the most likes and who has the most friends and who has uh, again, the TikTok thing, I, I, I don't do TikTok, so I don't know a whole lot about it, but I know there are a lot of people that have a lot of followers, and I don't know what that means, you know, mm. necessarily for, for life, but <laughs> it, all, it all feels like, look at me, it's all a competition, and I I wish life didn't have that quite so much, and I feel like social media really has expounded on that. Sure. Um. Some of it's probably come out in our our, uh, discussion here, but uh, do you have any advice for new cosplayers that we haven't touched on yet? Just get started. Just just do it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because that's that's the thing. I there are so many things that I've put off because I was intimidated uh, or I didn't feel like I had enough experience that uh, what do they call it? Um, Imposter syndrome. Mm. Uh, where you feel like I'm not good enough. Uh, no matter what I do, it'll never be as good as so and so's foam or so and so's uh, sewing. Or it, if you do that, you'll never start. So you have to just do what you're comfortable with and what you want to do, and and just 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 start. Just get going, and and you will love it. Uh, no matter what it is in life, whether it's the costuming or whatever. But mm-hmm. yeah, just try it. You're not going to know unless you try it. And if you need help, ask, because there are so many people that would be glad to help you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, what is something that you're a fan of that people might not expect? Well, since I'm in my 50s and <laughs> people see me as a grant granny, um, heavy metal, thrash. Um, that's, that's something that I've, I've liked since I was young. I'm kind of a, I miss the mosh. Um, uh, yeah, I, I can't headbang like I used to, uh, <laughs> I get dizzy and headaches, but, um, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm in there. yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that would surprise some people that, that I like thrash metal. Is there a place where they can follow you on social media? 
Um, I'm on face. I'm just on Facebook right now. Uh, people are pushing me to do the Instagram thing, but since I just do this for fun, I, I'm not sure I want to go there yet. My, maybe my kids will help out with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm on Facebook, but my name is Drachenmir, which is D R A C H E N M E R E, which is dragon in French or dragon in German and mother in French. So Drachenmir. Ah. <laughs> is my cosplay name but nobody can pronounce it so i've i've given up on trying to tell people how to say it most of the time but that's <laughs> that's how you're doing right now on on facebook so uh uh tell me a little bit about how you uh gravitated towards that name well uh again part of it had to do with the partner uh he's he's german his mom came over from germany and um i'm a big dragon fan i've always loved dragons and fantasy um, so dragon in German, Drachen, mm -hmm. uh, and then mother. I'm I'm kind of a con mom. I'm mm -hmm. kind of a busybody, and I'm trying to not do that. I I offer help when I don't need to sometimes, and I'm trying to learn to just leave people be. Um, <laughs> but con mom, so dragon mom, and then yeah, that's how that's how that worked because I couldn't find anything that worked with Electra or electric mm -hmm. or whatever. It all sounded silly to me, so. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I settled on for now, and maybe later <laughs> something a little bit different, easier to pronounce. Gotcha. <laughs> mm -hmm. cool. uh, any any parting words uh, for the uh, podcast? Um, I don't think so. I appreciate you talking with me, and it's it's nice to be able to talk about uh, costuming and and encouraging people to just just try things. So. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for, uh, for joining us, uh, Kelly. Um, and I will put your, uh, your name, uh, that's where they can find you on Facebook, uh, in the credits. All right. Well, thank you so much. I, I appreciate talking with you. Mm -hmm.